Coming up on Garden Talk. Well, let's say you're doing bottled nutrients and you would have your part A and your part B and your part A is for veg and then your part B is for flour. Well, our part A is fermented plant juice and our part B is fermented fruit juice. This is oriental herbal nutrient. It's used for plants, animals, and humans too. OHN helps get rid of pathogens, diseases, ailments. This could help boost your immune system. Fermented plant juice is a rich enzyme solution made out of beneficial biochemicals inside of the plant. And you let it soak and ferment for so many days and then you strain out the shells and then what you have left over is water soluble calcium. Soil is, is filled with life. And as a regenerative farmer, all you're doing is maintaining that life. What's up, everybody? For you that don't know me, my name is Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 57. In this episode, I interview Green's Goddess. She has been gardening for eight years and grows a variety of plants, such as vegetables, houseplants, herbs, and medicinal varieties. In this episode, she talks about a handful of KNF methods, which stands for Korean Natural Farming. She also talks about composting, bokashi, and reveals a high fungal tea recipe. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to Mars Hydro for sponsoring this episode. They have two different size heat mats, 10 by 20.75 inches and 48 by 20.75 inches. And you can get them with or without a digital thermostat. So you can really dial in the temperature. They also have grow bags. All of the grow bags are made of high quality thick fabric and have a handle for easy maneuvering. They have a ton of other products too, such as grow tents, grow lights, ventilation systems, and more. Check out their website at mars-hydro.com and you could use the discount code MrGrowIt for a discount on any of their products. Big shout out to AC Infinity for sponsoring this podcast. AC Infinity is well known to produce high quality products and provide excellent customer service. They have the thickest grow tent on the market today, inline fans with a controller that can automatically turn on and off according to specific set points. They have seedling mats, trimmers, drying racks, and several other products that you can use in your garden. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below, and you can use discount code MrGrowIt during checkout for a discount on their products. A big supporter of this podcast is Dutch Pro. They sponsor this podcast, and I use their nutrients. I have been using their base nutrients formulated specifically for RO and soft water. I also have been using some of their additives like CalMag, Silica, and their root stimulator called Take Root. They have a few other additives on top of those and pH regulators. Coupon code MrGrowIt10DP will get you a discount on their products. And I'll leave a link to their Amazon store down in the description section below. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Julie, aka Greens Goddess. How are you doing today? I'm doing amazing, Chris. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Good. Thanks for asking. I'm excited to talk to you today. <laughs> Uh, we had yes. a live stream that we did uh, not too long ago, and uh, I was on Twitch, and, and it was very, very successful. Lots of people loved the information that you gave. Uh, we had a lot of people in the chat that were really thankful that you came on board and uh, spit some knowledge, so I figured I'd have you on here, Garden Talk, and uh, let's get deeper into things. Nice, let's do it. So today we're going to talk about a handful of KNF methods, and then we're also going to get into composting, which may help many of you work towards a closed loop operation, right? Uh, but before we get into those things, let's do an introduction. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into gardening? Yeah, um, my name's Julie, uh, also known as Green's Goddess on Instagram. Um, I, at home, I like uh, gardening and growing a lot of different plants, um, herbs, vegetables, fruits, whatever, name it. I like growing it. Um, I've been having a lot of fun doing it and it's just very therapeutic I've found. Um, one thing I love doing is, is digging into natural farming because I want to be able to grow plants organically. 
And um, I think just microbials and stuff like that are extremely important in our lives. I'm glad that your uh, listeners on our last chat wanted to have me back. Thank you very much for letting me be here. It's, it's an honor. Thank you. Um, another thing I do is I run um, Luna Gardens. It, my website is lunagardens.co, and I just help um, educate people about plant medicine and how it helps people heal. So I'm really like involved in the plant world and how uh, natural plants can be used to help people heal from a variety of ailments and conditions and just everyday modern sickness, even, even just boosting your immune system. If we all ate more organic plants and spent more time out in nature and the sunshine and fresh air, it could, it could help all of us heal a lot. So I'm, I'm totally into stuff like that. <laughs> Totally into the natural way of doing things, which which is yes. cool. It's more sustainable way to do things. It uh, arguably well, is a cheaper money. way to do things. Yes. Yep. Yes. <laughs> exactly. You know, so there's so many benefits to, to going that route. Um, now, when we talk about KNF in particular, um, don't want to assume my audience knows what that is. Can you talk about like what is KNF and what inputs do you do? So um, KNF stands for Korean Natural Farming. Um, everything that I have ever learned about KNF, I I learned it online by watching Chris Trump's YouTube videos, and uh, you can even check out his website chrisTrump.com. He's got a lot of really great information on there about what type of inputs you want to use at what certain times and how you can make your own inputs. Uh, that's one of the things I've done um, to kind of like help save money by making your own inputs to put back into your garden. Um, there's some things that I have out here that I have made. Um, not this one. OHN, this is Oriental Herbal Nutrient. It's used for plants, animals, and humans too. It could, um, OHN helps to like get rid of pathogens, diseases, ailments. This could help boost your immune system. You could take a little bit of this every day. I can't open the jar right now because it's, it's made with sugar in the fermentation process and I got some on the lid and it's stuck. <laughs> but um, it's really great stuff. Humans can take just a little bit every day to help boost their immune system. You put like about four mils of this into a gallon of water and water your plants with it just once in a while, maybe once every couple of weeks or maybe once a month to help boost their immune system. Also, if, like for your cats, for example, or your plants, or if you have livestock, you could give just a little bit of this into the water and it'll help boost their immune system. So um, how do you make that? How do you go about making that juice. right there? If you've seen the video, he uses big jugs and I've done the same thing. So I've made so much. I would recommend anyone doing this at home to try to go with smaller jugs and smaller amounts but um you take uh ingredients like angelic root cinnamon ginger garlic and um i i used turmeric too not everybody uses turmeric in their ohn recipe but i've used it in mine because he had recommended it on his youtube page when or his youtube video when he made it at the time so i added it into mine because i did exactly as he did and uh, turmeric's really great for your heart and your blood anyway, so why not add it in with the rest of your OHN? Uh, this is something that's been used for centuries um, just as a tonic to help people feel better, but it could also be given to like plants and animals to help their, boost their immune system, help them feel better as well. So um, some of the ingredients are dry. You, you rehydrate them by letting them soak in beer and you can taste uh, the different beers in people's different OHNs. Like I have used IPA beer. A friend, um, my friend Matt Mile High Gardener, he had used um, stout, which actually tastes much better than mine. And uh, so the other ingredients, once you're done hydrating those ingredients, you move on to the next step, which is to put all the ingredients into a big jar of alcohol. And you let that sit for, it takes a long time. Um, like, I forgot how long it took me, but it was over a month. I remember I wrote all the dates down, but I went in there every single day and stirred those jars every day to mix the ingredients around. Um, and then you strain it through a strainer, then you put the ingredients back in, and then you fill the jar back up a third of the way, and then you add more alcohol to the jar. And then you let that sit for another, um, I think, two weeks or something. If you want more details, you got to check out his YouTube page because it'll have all the information. 
And then do you dilute it down before giving your plants? And how often do you give to the plants? So um, this is, in this way, it's straight uh, alcohol. Uh, and you would give it like just four mils, four milliliters per gallon of water. And you don't need to give it to your plants often. Maybe if you gave it to them once a week, once every other week would be fine. Foliar spraying is great too. Um, later on, I'll talk about um, the maintenance solution because this is something that you would mix three different ingredients. So OHN would be your first ingredient. Your second ingredient is fermented plant juice. I've made that. Fermented plant juice is usually made out of uh, fresh uh, roots, not roots, the fresh shoots. That's the word I'm thinking of. Fermented plant juice is, um, is a rich enzyme solution made out of um, beneficial biochemicals inside of the plant. So when you take a, a, a fresh, like say in your backyard, you've got weeds and you've got a lot of things growing fast. You go out there early in the morning and you harvest all of the tips. You put the tips into a big bucket and you mix it with equal weights of raw brown sugar. And you mix it together. Then you take it in like a jar. You take it in like a jar about this size and you smash it all down so that it's all compressed together. And then you put like a breathable lid on top and you leave it in a cool dark area for about two weeks, depending on the plant material. Some plants break down a lot faster than other plants, but basically through that osmotic pressure and fermentation, the um, sugar starts eating away at the plant and it starts releasing um, all of this great chemical compound in a liquid form. And then you strain off and you collect the liquid form. And you could use that liquid form. Same thing as um, the OHN, about four mils per gallon. Um, so there's two different things, the fermented plant the fermented plant juice is made out of like fresh leaves, fresh tips, greens. So you're using that to as an input for your veg side of things to help your plants grow fast in their veg stage. There's another thing called fermented fruit juice. I made this one. Nope. Fermented fruit juice. This is made out of fruits. Like with the fruits, you're uh, getting out all of the nutrients and, and chemical compounds in those fruits that are letting your plants know it's time to make more fruit. So same process, you cut up your fruits, you mix it in with equal weights of raw brown sugar, you put, push it in a, in a jar with a breathable lid and you give it like a couple of weeks for the fermentation process to do its thing and then you strain it out and you keep the liquid. The liquid uh, for fermented uh, fermented fruit juice, that's about eight mils when you're in flour. So um, fermented plant juice, OHN, and um, brown rice vinegar. Um, you could make it if you want. I just buy this off of Amazon. It's brown rice vinegar. This has so many great um, qualities, just this alone, how helpful it is for your plants. Um, it's basically like a cleanser. So that brown rice vinegar plus OHN plus fermented plant juice is all added together to make a maintenance solution. So when you, you could order these products, by the way, off of somebody that you know, like who's making them. There's a lot of people making KNF products and selling them. So if you don't want to make it yourself, but you want to give it a try, you could totally buy it off of them. This is my um, KNF maintenance solution. It's those three ingredients, OHN, fermented plant juice, and brown rice vinegar mixed together. So if I wanted to give my plants a boost, I'd give them just a little bit of this, 20 mils per gallon. Uh, soil drench or foliar spray is fine. Just a little bit. You don't need to overdo it. How often do you do the maintenance solution? Um, If I was... So you, I don't think that you need to do it if you're foliar spraying and also doing a soil drench, then maybe one or the other. If you're doing it just once a week, it's fine. Uh, when you go into flower, you don't want to foliar spray anymore. You want to put it in the soil. Once a week is fine. Once every other week is fine, too. Also, I've made water-soluble calcium. Well, actually, sorry. Before we move on to that, um, I did have a question okay. about... The um, fermented plant juice, so just to kind of quick recap, 
four milliliters per gallon for the fermented plant juice. And that is going to mostly be veg. You had mentioned the vegetation stage. And then the, the fruit um, fermented juice, uh, fermented fruit juice would yeah. be used during flower. Um, that's eight milliliters per gallon. Um, so you can use them individually or you can make that um, maintenance solution that you spoke about, right? So you can do either or, right? Yeah. Um, the maintenance solution that I've made is only with the fermented plant juice. So. Okay, I, gotcha. Not, not the fermented fruit juice. It does kind of get a bit confusing. <laughs> okay, but, that makes um, sense. You could totally use just fermented um, fruit juice with uh, water and just water that to your plants. The OHN and uh, is, is kind of used sparingly. Same thing with the uh, brown rice vinegar, just a little bit. You don't need to add it all the time, but it's definitely beneficial to have it in there. So let's say you're doing bottled nutrients and you would have your part A and your part B and your part A is for veg and then your part B is for flour. Well, our part A is fermented plant juice and our part B is fermented fruit juice. There's also... Um, you could use all sorts of types of different fruits to make the fermented fruit juice. I heard you should probably stay away from citric fruits and um, pineapple. Uh, but my friend that does fermented plant extracts makes this fermented pumpkin. So if you didn't want to make it yourself, you could buy it off of somebody else. And then same thing, this one's like the comfrey. This one you would use in veg. This one... I would use in flour. So you get things from build a soil, don't you? Oh yeah. Yep. Definitely. Uh, have you I use them. Plant juice or? I have not. No, that's something I've been, I've been wanting to do. So I think maybe this year I'll definitely experiment with uh, fermented juices. Absolutely. Yeah. What was that other thing that you were going to show behind you? The, I'll see I cut you off before I cut you off. <laughs> that's okay. Water soluble calcium. Oh, okay. This is made with um, your eggs. You collect all of your eggshells, preferably organic, and see if you're doing your own regenerative farming and you had chickens, you would just use your own chicken eggshells. But that's. Um, but what you do is you collect eggshells and you crush them up and then you cook them, preferably outdoors on a pan until they get like nice and brown. And then you put them into like one of these containers of brown rice vinegar. And you let it soak and ferment for so many days, and then you strain out the shells, and then what you have left over is water soluble calcium, available to be taken up. To the plants love it; they'll take it immediately. You mentioned the eggshell should be uh, laid out, and that you should potentially cook it outside. So you wouldn't recommend that they do it inside in like their oven, for example. Well, like on your stove top, you could if you wanted to. Um, for a lot of people, it creates a nasty odor, so they just prefer to do it outside is all. Uh, okay. uh, I did mine outside, so I just grabbed a um, one of those cast iron pans and went outside and mixed it all around. you got to keep mixing it so it's nice and brown. And um, so if you don't clean out your egg shells, they do kind of have this white, fluffy stuff that needs to be cooked off. You don't want that stuff in your solution. Just the eggshell itself, not any part of the embryo or yolk or anything. I was going to say, is there a specific ratio of eggshells to vinegar? Um, yes. One-tenth eggshells and the other nine-tenths to brown rice vinegar. Okay. And, um... That one you would apply a little bit when you first transition your plants, about four mils per gallon. Uh, later on in flower, when they start producing, um, then you would put um, eight mils per gallon. Gotcha. Yeah, good information there. I know uh, there's quite a few people who want to ditch the bottle of CalMag, and this is the way to do it, right? Because you're getting calcium through the eggshells through this process. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm glad you shared that today. There's, there, there's other easier ways to add in um, magnesium, like um, Epsom salt. Yep. So, but the, the funny thing is everyone's always saying more CalMag when something goes wrong, and, and it could possibly be a lockout of another nutrient, not that you're missing that nutrient. 
just that you added too much of one thing and you got to lock out of something else. Happened to me. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the running joke is just add more CalMag and then it's like, well, what type of CalMag? Is it military CalMag? Is there, <laughs> is there a medical grade CalMag? <laughs> I love the old, a, um, what was that one uh, skit that people would say like, I have a disease. And the only cure is more CalMag. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many memes out there. It's so funny. I know. <laughs> so the other stuff, um, water-soluble calcium. And uh, I already showed you my bloom for a minute. Sea salt. Sea salt is one of the ingredients, one of the KNF minerals. Um, and just a little bit uh, throughout the whole growth cycle. Uh, I wrote down here one to two grams of sea salt per liter of water. Once you measure it out in your hand, then you know how much goes in and I put it in my water and I let it swirl around and I put that in. Uh, this is fish amino acid. I got this off of a friend from Neverwinter Farms. This is his FAA. He's got a buddy that uh, is a fisherman. So he goes to his friend all the time to get fish off of him. He loves fish. I'm not a big fan of fish myself, so I would I don't want to go out there and go fishing. <laughs> so if you love fishing, but uh, let's say you come home and you're eating up some parts and you've got a whole bunch of heads and tails left over, whatever you're not eating, you take all your fish, same thing that you do with the rest of the inputs, equal weights of brown sugar, put it in a bucket, shove it down, um, let it ferment for a long time. Fish amino acid takes a long, long, long time to ferment. Um, but this could be used um, all throughout the growth of your plants. A little bit more uh, during the beginning of your plants because they need a little bit more of that nitrogen. Not so much towards the end. This has a lot of um, nitrogen-rich nutrients and enzymes and stuff like that in it. And like, for example, if I couldn't make it myself, you could always buy it off of somebody else. This is Conscience Natural Inputs. Before I started making my own KNF inputs, I was getting his just to test the waters and to see if I liked it or not. And then after that, some things are easy to get. The salt's easy to get. The brown rice vinegar is easy to get. You could get this. It's easy to buy it and just give it a try if you wanted to grow organically. So these are the KNF inputs that I have been messing around with. I, I really love it. I don't know if it's because I just love making things so much. But I just have a good time making all these inputs. Fermented plant juice is my favorite. It took me so many tries before I got it right doing fermented uh, plant juice with leaves. But that depends on which leaves you're buying. Some of them break down really easily and some of them don't. And it's a learning process. You learn along the way. Sometimes you just got to jump in and get your hands wet. <laughs> I also wanted to get into that a little bit, leaf mold, right? I mean, you spoke about it a little bit on the live stream. Um, I think it's value added to speak about it here as well. Can you talk to us about leaf mold and how you get that? Leaf mold is what happens when um, you're like out like under a tree or in the forest or something like that. And all the branches and all the leaves and everything that may have grown and then died and then grown and then died, they all start to collect and they are what is making up your soil. It's all mulch. So that's another thing why mulch is one of my favorite things to have around. It's great when it can help keep your soil moist. Uh, but even better is the breaking down of the mulch. Just because a leaf is dead doesn't mean that it lost the nutrients that were inside of it. It's still stored in there. As it breaks down in mulch, as it becomes a leaf mold is when things like um, fungi and bacteria and other microorganisms start coming in and decomposing and breaking it all down for you. Now, when they come in to decompose and break down, those are the guys that are feeding your plant's roots the nutrients that came out of that mulch. So one reason why we always say to chop and drop it, if you're, if you're cutting it off, just leave it on the ground or on your bed, whatever setup you got, and um, just kind of let nature do the rest. As long as you've got a, a healthy dose of microbials, fungi, bacteria, um, nematodes, protozoa, worms, just things breaking down that matter for you, they do all the work so that you don't have to. So leaf mold, there's a few things you could do to go out to the forest to collect it and bring it back. 
you could um to dom to dom's way of um of grabbing uh microorganisms and bringing them back into your garden is to go out and dig preferably under like something where you've seen a tree that has fallen down and a lot of dead material has already decomposed and new life has already grown on top of it if you dig underneath that that's where you could find all the fungi and all the mycelium and that's where you know that you got a good network of leaf mold soil down there like it's hardly recognizable anymore it sort of looks like soil but technically it's not soil but that what is soil made up of you know it's made up of mulch that's been decomposed time after time after time after time. And so you grab a handful of that and you could bring it back home and you can make um, Jadam microbial solution. And sort of the same thing as a compost tea where that you're giving it some carbs to feed it like a baked potato, a little bit of that sea salt in the bottom of the bucket and um, you let it sit in the middle of the bucket for a few days, depending on the temperature. And uh, there'll be a ring around the edge when the microbes are ready. It's like a, I think that that might be an outcome of yeast or something. Some type of action is happening in there that causes that ring of bubbles to happen. And once you have that ring, it's a perfect opportunity. You gotta use it immediately. You take that big bucket of five gallons you mix it in with uh, maybe another 20, 30 gallons of water, and you apply that to all of your plants to introduce all those microbials into your plants, into the soil. Another way to do it, like the Korean natural farming way, they call it um, IMO, which stands for indigenous microorganisms. Uh, their way of doing it is by having some slightly cooked rice in a box, and then you go out to the forest, and then you dig to till you find that area where you see a lot of mycelium, the leaf mold. Uh, you hardly recognize the material that's in there anymore, but you can tell that there is a lot of great fungal life down there. You put your collection box on top of that, and then you kind of not bury it, but cover it up so it's safe from like bugs and critters or maybe other people walking by wondering what a box is doing there. Uh, leave that for a few days and that also depends on the temperature. You're supposed to be able to take collections any time of year, including the winter time. But um, me personally, I'm having a really hard time doing a winter collection right now because all the places I have tried haven't turned out to be so successful. But um, you can't give up just because it doesn't work out the first time. You know, you got to keep trying. But um, when you have a good successful collection, a lot of fungi is growing on top of your rice, like a nice white puffy cloud. Some colors are okay, a little bit, a little bit of mix is okay. Too much of any one color is not okay. Um, then you take that collection, you bring it back home with your moldy rice, and um, you mix it equal weights with brown, like brown sugar, raw brown sugar, and you let that sit in a jar to ferment, that becomes shelf stable. So if you wanted to do several collections, you have all your little jars, your shelf stable jars, once they've been mixed with the uh, brown sugar. Then um, there's, there's several processes like IMO1 and IMO2 and IMO3. So these are all the different steps. Um, the next step when you have your collection is to mix it in water with some other things. I haven't gotten this far yet. You mix it in water with some other uh, stuff like um, a little bit of labs and I believe a little bit of the OHN and um, I think sugar I'm not sure if you're adding more sugar to that concoction or not you're brewing it around kind of like a tea and then you're using it to water like malted barley and wood chips and stuff like that um, then that creates like this pile that could get really hot so you got to keep turning it every once in a while to make sure it doesn't get too hot. You want it to increase its temperature, but not get above a certain temperature. And um, eventually what happens after, you know, you've turned it enough times and it cooked and it's cooling down and, and now it's completely finished, you could use that finished product uh, to sprinkle around your garden. Or you could use it as a tea and it's a liquid IMO. Um, but that is a really amazing way to introduce microorganisms into your soil. And you've got to let your microorganisms do all the work for you. You don't have to 
continuously add all these ingredients when your soil's hooked up and it's got plenty of microorganisms, fungi, bacteria, um, nematodes, worms, anthropods, microanthropods, um, protozoa, all sorts of cool stuff. Soil is, is filled with life. And um, as a regenerative farmer, all you're doing is maintaining that life. It blows my mind how many practices there are out there that you can do uh, in order to grow these plants, right? Um, so many different ways to do it. I'm sure a lot of these viewers that are, are or listeners that are tuning into this, um, their minds are blown because they're so used to just growing with bottles or just growing organically using just a blend uh, that they top dress in or uh, initially yeah. amend in the medium, then top dress throughout the grow. Um, but using these other methods, um, you can get away with not doing any of those top dressings uh, of blends, you know, not using them at all or using yeah. bottled nutrients at all. You know, KNF is, is uh, another way to go about it, you know, and you can have great success uh, with KNF. So. Absolutely. If you want to learn more about KNF, you've got to talk to um, Chris Trump. I already reached out to him and told him about the show today. And I said, can I um, have Mr. Grow it reach out to you so that you could come on and talk to his learners? He said, yes, absolutely. I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. Thanks for the hookup there. Yeah, I've, I've heard his name so much. And uh, he is somebody who I, I would love to have on the podcast because his knowledge is just extensive uh, when it comes to that, and so um, yeah, yeah knows, thanks for thanks for hooking it up there. <laughs> uh, absolutely, he knows he knows way more about KNF than I do, um, and I'm I'm just very fortunate. I had the pleasure of having him over and, and showed him my garden, and he said to me, um, "You're doing too much, and you need to back off." So I was like, it, "It didn't it didn't comprehend to me until after some time that I have learned that." The thing about bottled nutrients is you feel like you have to constantly be adding something, but when you're growing organically, you don't have to constantly be adding stuff. It's all right there for you. You're just maintaining, you know, so that's what, that's what makes it real easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> let's, uh, let's flip it up. Let's talk about composting. So I know that's a topic that you wanted to get into today. Um, I do a little bit of composting myself. I do vermicomposting, so I have just a nice. small... I think it's like 20 something gallon bin uh, in my garage. It's winter time right now. So everything's cold and everything's moving pretty slow, but Hey, I, I've got something going. I'm sure once the uh, springtime and summertime uh, comes along and the, the temperature heats up a little bit, there's going to be a lot more activity uh, in my bin. Um, but this is something that it's often said that every home grower should be doing is, is sure. composting. And if there's so many can. different ways to compost, right? Um, so vermicomposting, the, what I just explained is just one way of doing it. You could have a regular compost pile, um, even outdoors. Uh, that's another way to go about it. You want to talk to us about composting, like what you do, what you know about it, so on and so forth. So, um, I'm doing some composting myself. I haven't, I haven't reached the point where I have had a, my own finished compost product yet. If you can do a composting where you're at, absolutely go for it. Not everybody has that opportunity because, like, let's say you live in an apartment or something like that. If you needed to buy compost online, you absolutely could. Same thing with, like, vermicompost and worm castings. I just highly recommend that if you are going to be purchasing it from somebody else, right now during the winter time is the perfect time to go ahead and place that order because of the temperatures are so cold this time of year. If you try doing it during the summertime, you don't know how long that bag has been sitting out in the sun for. So all those great microorganisms that maybe were once thriving in there, the majority of them are dead by the time it even gets to your place. So just something to consider when composting, if you're buying it off of somebody else, purchase it during the wintertime, bring it back to your area, store it in a nice, dark, cool place. I like having my compost in, um, in a bin with a lid on it. One thing that I've noticed just leaving my bag out in my garden is it definitely attracts a lot of gnats and flies. So for me, I roll it up tightly, put a clip on it, and then I put it in a bin that's locked. If there is a time, it's usually during the summertime, that these that more uh, little fungus flies or gnats start coming in, and I notice them on my compost, I'll put up one of those yellow sticky traps and just lay it directly on my compost bag and then put the lid on it and seal it for like two weeks and don't even touch it. Every single one of those flies comes out, hits that sticky trap and doesn't go anywhere after that. 
So that totally works to try to keep that population down. If you notice that same thing, like with your vermicompost bin, sometimes you open it and if one, it only takes one little fly to get in there and mess things up for you. I hate it when that happens. I have my um, vermicompost bin indoors. I just started that. Um, it's just a plastic tote, some holes poked all around the top and all around the bottom. I filled it up with, uh, well, I had an old 10 gallon pot that I was using. So I just used that. I put in a whole bunch of plant material to give it time to die out. I added in a handful of Bokashi to give it the plant material to break down and then some kitchen food scraps. What else did worms also like um, oatmeal, cornmeal, stuff like that added in like a little treat. Um, half of an avocado, uh, preferably a slightly, you know, rotten. Uh, it, when it's mushier, they get in there quicker. I've noticed if I put in a fresh avocado, they're not going anywhere near it because uh, maybe it's too hard for them to break it down. But um, if you want to speed up your worm population, that's the easy way to do it. One thing, I, uh, vermicompost is, is really amazing, but it, it is high in bacteria. That's just something to consider depending on which types of plants you're growing because um, uh, annuals, things like that usually like really high bacteria environment and soil to grow in. And typically trees, shrubs, or your perennials usually like more of a fungi dominant soil to grow in. So also it has a ratio of bacteria to fungi. Your annuals like more bacteria and your perennials like more fungi. But vermicompost is really awesome. It's got a lot of bacteria and the uh, worm castings are coated with polysaccharides and carbohydrates and simple proteins. So vermicompost is really rich in nutrients. Uh, it can help retain moisture and it helps the soil, like soil structure and conditioning of soil too, um, might be able to help get rid of some pathogens. Anytime anyone is mixing up new soil that they want to start a new garden in, you should add vermicompost, which is worm castings, and regular compost, like cow manure. Mix it in with, um, I always like native soil because of the sand, silt, and clay that's involved. You need that for cation exchange. And so I like mixing the compost in with that and then putting a topsoil on top and then waiting about two weeks and then putting your plants into that topsoil area. When they're ready, they'll go after that compost and they'll just be sitting there waiting for them. Um, vermicompost is a really easy way to take care of um, getting rid of kitchen scraps or stuff like that. It's nice to use it for tea if you wanna give it to your plants. Regular composting can take a bit longer. Uh, there's hot composting and then there's cold composting. Hot composting, um, it's it's ready pretty quickly. Uh, it gets really hot and it really cooks and you gotta, you gotta turn it and mix it so that way what was in the center is now on the outside and what was on the outside is now in the center to, to even it out. Um, anything about composting or the soil food web, I would highly recommend checking out Dr. Elaine Ingham's videos. She goes into so much detail, that is her jam. She loves talking about the soil food web and composting. And even um, Lowensville, the guy that wrote this book, he uh, took her course and got into um, composting and the soil food web with her and highly recommends checking her out as well. Um, I like doing com cold composting. It's what I'm doing myself, or I call it the lazy compost. That's where you're just kind of putting like a layer of browns in and a layer of greens. And when you got kitchen scraps, you put it on there. If you've got um, specific type of manures. Uh, this year I have used uh, aged horse manure along with, uh, and I layered it like a lasagna. So browns include anything that's dead, like dead leaves, dead weeds, um, cardboard, paper, some things can be decomposed really quickly, your trash that's mainly um, paper material. Uh, then you got your greens, which basically means anything alive, like uh, plants that were alive, um, food, food uh, that you had ate in your kitchen scraps, poop, I guess that's considered um, a green. Uh, greens offer more nitrogen and browns offer more carbon. 
And so this is why I like to do a nice layer of both when I'm doing my cold composting because, and I sprinkle a handful of Bokashi on, on it to get it, you know, rocking and rolling a little bit faster. But uh, I just sit there and, and leave it be outside and I don't have to mess with it. I don't have to turn it too much. I don't have to do anything but um, wait for time and it'll just it, like break itself down to the point that you now have this really rich brown material that's kind of like most of it is unrecognizable. You wouldn't have been able to tell really what went into it. You could use that compost the same way you could, you could use vermicompost. You could sprinkle it uh, around your garden beds, like put it on top. Uh, as long as it's a few inches away from the stem of any of your plants. Or you can make a compost tea. That's one of my favorite ways to do it because if you only have so much compost, you really want it to spread and, and last a long time. So using just a handfuls and making a tea out of it, and you can apply tea. You could apply it often, but I personally only do tea once a week. And um, even like with indoors on the beds that I have, I'm slowly starting to back off of that. Because I've been doing compost teas for so long in these beds, they're like good, they don't need any more. You don't need to keep on reapplying it. But this is, this is a bed. There's so much to learn about growing in a bed versus growing outdoors in the ground where it's a lot easier. In a bed, you have this controlled environment. Once you put things in there, it doesn't leave. And Whereas outdoors, it could kind of, you know, go somewhere else and, you know, go to, to the next soil or somewhere else or deeper into the ground. So you got to be very careful not to add, not to overdo it with the compost. Um, a really light tea once a week is fine. If you are reusing your soil, watch out after doing it for so many runs or so many years. Um, if you're doing it in a bed. Outdoors, probably not that big of a deal, but some people have applied top amendments and some people have watered with compost and after so many years, their soil is just so enriched with microbial life that they don't need to do anything other than to keep it wet. So that's where that magic happens, where you've already done so much to your soil, now it's totally hooked up and you don't need to do anything else to it other than just keep it moist. Compost is really awesome. Compost and vermicompost, super simple, easy ways to put nutrients and microbials back into your soil and let the microbials do all the work for you. You don't need to do it. When I started my vermicompost bin, it's very similar to what, what you explained, right? So you got the bin, poke holes in the bottom. I actually have a screen on the inside so things don't escape out those holes in the bottom. Holes around the top as well. And then to start it, I did a... Uh, Pretty standard. A lot of people do this is the brick of cocoa uh, mixed mm -hmm. with some shredded paper or some people mm -hmm. use uh, shredded cardboard as well. Um, so mixing that all together, adding in worms. So buying uh, worms from Uncle Jim's Worm Farm. Um, I bought the Red Wrigglers and I bought the European Nightcrawlers. So diversity nice. um, is what I was aiming for there. Um, and then add again your, your inputs, the, the greens and, and, and browns. So normally for greens, what I'll add is I'll add in just any kind of leftover salad stuff that isn't eaten. Um, anything real green vegetables uh, goes in the bin. Um, I also add in eggshells. And yep. I add in a lot of uh, coffee grounds as well. So those are kind of the main things that come to mind that I typically add in the bin. And typically I'll do it on a weekly basis. So I know um, a lot of people are wondering frequency, how often should you be adding stuff in there? You can actually get to a point where you put too much in there, right? So like yes. uh, too much food for the worms, it can go anaerobic, it can mm -hmm. have a lot of you know, gnats flying around or, or, or pests flying around. And so it can really turn into a bad environment if, if you aren't doing things right, doing things right, uh, which is something that, that I quickly learned. I had a gnat problem for a while, but um, I ended up uh, balancing things out, I feel like, and, and getting more aeration down there and the moisture level correct and all that stuff. Yep. And now I feel like things are, are, are going pretty good there. So, but normally I'll, I'll add stuff in on a weekly basis. Wow. And I'll kind of rotate around on the different sections of the bin, right? So like, okay. you know, maybe the top right corner I'll do one week. Then the next week I'll go to the bottom, you know, right corner. 
and then I'll kind of rotate around. And by the time I get back down to that corner that I started in, it's usually broken down at that point. Um, and then I'm able to add in more in, in that area. But uh, I had it for about four months so far. Um, and so I, I don't feel like I'm, I'm able to take things from that bin yet and use it for anything. I think it takes uh, longer than that. Um, I know some people say they don't even start pulling stuff out of there until like a year into it. So I'm not yeah. sure what your take on that is, if it's like six months or a year, or when do you start it using the, the on compost? how much activity, like you're saying, this time of year, it's a lot colder, so they might not be working so fast because they're not moving a whole lot, versus during the summertime when they're warmer, they are working a lot faster, so they are going through and, and composting everything for you a lot quicker. Um, the other trick, I think we were talking about this last time we did our show, was... Um, Instead of just, you could just put your food scraps in there, but instead of doing that, you could also put them in a blender so that they're already broken down and extremely available to all the worms yep. and other microbial life. Because it's not just worms that make up that worm bin. It's it's the fungi and the bacterium and other things breaking it down, and then the worms come and eat that. Like I said with the avocado, they the worms did not want to touch a nice, fresh, um, hard avocado. They wanted it to be partially starting to like turn brown a little bit rotten um they don't like citrus stuff i've heard they don't like the orange peels or or lemon peels or anything like that they won't eat it or go near it um i always like throwing in apples and stuff like that um i like cornmeal it just it's funny i've watched so many videos on uh vermicomposting and there's this sweet english lady that loved her worm bin and would go on about all these treats she was giving her worms she goes, I love to give new treats like the cornmeal. <laughs> and I think about that every time I go to open up my worm bin when it's time to give them a little food. I'm like, give them a little cornmeal. <laughs> but it, it's fun. Like, it's fun to make it. Um, it does take a while until you can actually reap the rewards of the vermicompost bin. But um, once you do have it going and, and you get it and you understand it, and then you could kind of keep like maybe two bins. Like maybe this bin is ready to be harvested a little bit out of while this bin is working, you know. And that's just a super, super easy way to put more micronutrients and microbial life back into your soil that's readily available to your plants. Absolutely. It's a step towards closed loop operation. So for sure. And then the same thing with the outdoor composting in the cold compost pile, worms will make their way up there. So that outdoor compost pile also has worm doo-doos in it also. So you are totally good to use that. You don't, if you're outdoors, you don't need both the outdoor pile and a worm bin. I use my worm bin for the indoor stuff. Bokashi is like uh, also fermented organic matter. It's extremely, extremely easy. It's, it's, it's a lot like the whole IMO process, except for with Bokashi, um, they use it. They buy that bottle of EM1 from Terogenics, and they take that, they put it in a big old five-gallon bucket of water with a little bit of molasses and stir it up real nicely. Then they use that water to soak um, malted bran uh, or malted barley, sorry. They use that water to soak malted barley. And then um, you let that sit and ferment in a plastic baggie for like two weeks. And then after that, you take it out and then you let it dry out. It takes a few days and you turn it so often. But once it's completely dry, you now have like Bokashi that could be put in a bag or a shelf stable. You could buy Bokashi. This is from Kashi Blend. And uh, let me show you what it looks like on the inside. Bokashi is another really amazing, great tool that you could use the same way as like other composting, you could um, put it on top of your soil. You could put it right next to your plants. It'll help. Uh, it'll help increase the microbial population. It'll help with fungi. It'll help with the bacteria. Um, it puts a lot of nutrients and enzymes and whatnot back into your soil. See, this is what Bokashi looks like. Okay. Yeah, I use Grow Kashi, which is a brand of it, I believe. Um, yeah, by uh, this one's by Growing Organic. So this one has the rice bran, uh, a lot of other wheat bran, and insect frass. 
molasses and then the EM, but they put other stuff in here like um, biochar and uh, high nitrogen amino acids. So with the, with the compost and the Bokashi, once you have enough, you don't need to keep reapplying it. And so it's just something to look, you, you don't need to do too much. Just a little bit is good enough. And I love, personally love using this Bokashi. If you've seen a lot of people showing off their soils and you see the little uh, fungi, little mycelium growing, and they say, man, ever since I put that Bokashi down, that's exactly what they're talking about. You can make a compost tea. This is, um, this is a recipe that I wanted to give your uh, viewers with the compost tea. You basically get, um, and you can buy compost or worm castings from your local grocery store or online. Um, just be careful about it not being out in the sun and, or you know, direct sunlight or getting too hot. But this recipe is really awesome. You get um, one cup of Oli Mountain compost, a half a cup of worm castings, you get a handful of Bokashi, you mix all that together along with um, two tablespoons of oatmeal flour and um, one tablespoon of rock phosphate and oh yeah two tablespoons of barley but I use gnarly barley from Clackamas Coop and uh, you mix all that together you get a little bit wet I put this up on my Instagram page today just to show everybody the recipe and how to make it I make it all the time you mix it together you get it a little bit moist then you put it in a container with a cover on but not all the way on just slightly on top and um, you wait for about three days. It's gotta be in a warm but dark location so that the fungi on it can grow. So I made this three days ago so I could show you guys. Usually if you're storing this, I, I leave the lid like that. So that way a little bit of air could get in. The lid's not completely sealed. And this is what happens three days later. Oh, okay. You see this nice mycelium? When you go out to the forest and you're trying to get a collection, of um, indigenous microorganisms, this is what you're looking for. You could make it yourself. It, it's not the same. I personally prefer just all sorts of, of a variety, a diverse variety of different things. But this, see how like nice and soft this is? It kind of smells like apple cider vinegar. Yeah. I call it uh, Santa's beard. Also in that um, Teeming with Microbes book, he shows you uh, how you can make this. This recipe I got off my friend, Random Nicole 420. So it's kind of like a, a cake. Huh. And what I would do um, when it's time. See that? Oh, okay. Breaking it right open there. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> when it's time, I put this in a, in a tea bag and I make a tea out of this. This will create a, a fungi rich compost. And this is good for plants that love fungi. You could feed this tea to any of your plants because fungi life lasts for so long as long as you maintain, maintain it. That's so funny. <laughs> That's so cool. I'm definitely gonna have to take that recipe and try it out. I will send it to you, but I'm telling you, it's the coolest thing ever if you could, if you make this, and I've tried a few different ways to get it right, you know, just cold and dark. I mean, I wouldn't eat this, but it does smell <laughs> really good. It reminds me of like fruit or apple cider vinegar. As long as it smells good, it's good to work with. If, if, if it starts smelling really nasty or funky, then it's no good. And nice thing about Bokashi, one of the things that it does is it helps to get rid of all that smell, funky smells of anything, and it helps them to break down faster. This has created a lot of fungi life, a lot of bacteria. There's a lot of great things in here that I could use and put in my, um, my tea. And then this tea I give to my plants about once a week until I notice that my plants have had too much by checking out their leaves, then I start backing off. That's so, so awesome. I wanted to share that recipe with you guys. I hope you guys can make it and give it a try. And, and if you find any way to make this any more white than what I can do, then please share your recipe with me. I'd love to see it. Awesome. I'll definitely have I to try that out. This. That's uh, that's really cool. I love how there's so many different ways to, to go about, you know, feeding these plants or, you know, providing care for these plants. It's, uh, you know, we talked about so many things that are like, 
your non-traditional way of growing. Yeah. And it just, it opens wait, up your wait, mind wait. and it, uh, it makes things fun. It, it really does. So, uh, it does. I'm, it's same on traditional, but that's the funny thing, isn't it? Yeah. It is very traditional. Why did we switch from our traditional simple ways of farming to go to this new thing that said we had to go out and buy nutrients from bottles? I could go into details, but I'm not gonna. It's just, it's regenerative farming is what I'm getting into right now. I'm not like, I'm not totally deep, you know, into it. I am. Who am I kidding? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm super thankful to have you on here today. Wrapping things up, how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Um, you can find me on Instagram, Greens Goddess. Um, in the future, let's see, right now I'm getting into some bubble hash because I'm still processing things from the freezer from outdoor season. And as um, soon as the weather starts warming up, I'm going to be working on uh, my yard because... I got all these seeds from Never Winter Farms, and now I got to grow all this food. So that's one thing that I'm going to be working on a lot more of these uh, IMO collections and uh, just just watering my yard, my backyard with that to hook up the soil to get it ready for me to start planting food in. That's what I'd really like to look forward to this coming up season is, is making a lot more plants, making a lot more healthy food. You know, plants are medicine. You know, I want to help people heal. And I, I don't I don't think people should pay an arm and a leg for like some apples. You know, apples should taste good. <laughs> so. Well, I'll definitely have a link to your Instagram down in the YouTube description section below. Um, so people can tune in to your channel, to your content. And uh, yeah, if you enjoyed this video, click that thumbs up button on YouTube. Uh, follow or subscribe on one of the either YouTube or one of the podcast platforms because uh, every single week releasing these Garden Talk podcast episodes. Julie, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. This has been uh, this has been awesome. This is really cool. You opened thank up my mind, and uh, I think a lot of my audience is is really going to open up their mind as well. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank <laughs> you.